like to do is to take the next couple of minutes to really talk about what I think um, we need to be thinking about. And so I always like to do this when I am, it doesn't matter whether I'm teaching at Harvard, whether I am at a community center, I like to start with asking a particular kind of question. And so wherever you are right now, I would like for you to just kind of get centered, have a Zen moment, because I need a Zen moment right now, have a Zen moment and close your eyes and I'm going to ask you a question. My question to you is, what would your nation look like without ism? What would leadership look like? What about institutions? What about policies? What would your nation look like without racism? Whether that's Canada, whether that's America, whether that's in Europe. Now, you can open your eyes. Now, I can't see you. I don't know what your answer is. Um, I do everywhere I ask that question, it's extremely difficult for people to actually see something. You know, when I ask the question nine times out of 10, most fake people say, I can't see anything because we've so normalized racism. It's so such a part of, you know, of the culture and the fabric of all of the societies and the nations that we're a part of that is actually a vision what would this what would our nation be without it and so i think that that is a challenge that part of what i want to do is in starting this conversation you know it's really around when we're talking about passing policy when we're talking about tax reform when we're talking about all of those pieces i think that we actually have to really think about some of the basics that we really should 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 address and so there's two pieces in this moment if nothing else i think COVID 19 has kind of forced us it's forced the entire world to kind of stop and slow down with the opportunity to kind of reassess and rethink about where, but I also think it's opened up an opportunity for us to reimagine. You know, sort of like I'm trying to reimagine myself being in my, my studio in my home right now in while I'm in my car coming to you. You know, that we have to really push ourselves to really imagine, reimagine what it is that we seek to to, to um, create in the world? What is it that we seek for humanity? And so in that process, I think it's important as we're looking at what's happening now, you know, what we're ha what's happening all over the world, what is happening in my country of America, you know, I am, many may know, um, some of you may not, but I am a native of Selma, Alabama. That's actually where I, um, where I grew up. That's where I learned how to organize that part of what Selma is known for is the voting rights movement, that there were the African-American community in this nation, in this area, actually to uh, create, they had a larger vision. They didn't necessarily have government, they really didn't have the majority of public support on their side, but they were very, and they had a clear vision. And what they knew was that we had to actually, we, they wanted to assert themselves. And they and they knew that it wouldn't just help them. It also would expand voting rights for all of America. It was actually in democracy. And so this it marks the 56th anniversary of one of the infamous days that we know is called Bloody Sunday. And on that Sunday, I know there are images, um, film images, some of you all may have seen, where there were peaceful marches on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And as they kneeled down um, to pray, you know, they were turned around the first time. And then when they, they actually, when they got to the end of the bridge, when they got to the foot of the bridge, they were troopers. Some who were sitting um, on horses, some of them um, with billy clubs, and they, they so vicious, viciously marches that it was known as Sunday. And it was a turning point for them. And so I'm raising that for a number of reasons. I'm raising it for the reason that fundamentally, the determination and the commitment um, and the resiliency of those people actually changed the course of history. You know, and fundamentally, even when we're thinking about, they didn't have a lot of support. This was a committed group of people who believed in a greater, had a greater vision for themselves and their community that ultimately expanded rights, not just for themselves, but also for the entire nation. And in fact, strengthened 
um, democracy as we knew it in, in America. And then, but the third thing that I want to say is that they did not wait until it was convenient. They did not wait to say, well, this isn't the, this, we've got to wait to the right circumstances, to the right political parties are in office, to where we've got the majority of people helping us. They moved on what they knew in their hearts and their spirits. It was the right thing to do. And they actually courageously stood in that and moved and pushed forward. And so I think that there's something very instructive to us that as we reflect 56 years later, that in this moment, there's an opportunity. What has been revealed, you know, during this COVID-19, I so appreciate the previous speaker sharing that as what, what has been revealed is how we have such an unbalanced tax system, how that literally it, that we have uh, the, the haves and the have nots, that we have not been very good stewards of the earth and we've not been very good, good stewards of literally and teachers of sharing with each other, that there is a way that we can actually, there's enough wealth and resources on this beautiful, abundant planet that we can actually create systems that literally are more equitable and more just and more um, and healthy and whole. And so part of it is there's going to take us doing a couple of things. Instead of us being transactional, we're going to have to think transformatively. And so in this moment, you know, as I get ready to just kind of share what these two questions that, that the reason why I asked the question around what would your nation look without racism is because I want to ask, I'm going to have a follow-up question. My follow-up question to you is, what has ever been created and brought into the physical world that was not first envisioned? A car, cup of coffee, everything that is, exists in the physical world is because someone first had to envision it. And so if we're really serious about ending racism, if we're really serious about creating a more fair and just system and equitable systems, then we actually envision what will be the outcome. We have to envision that world and that nation that people have access um, to quality housing. And we have to envision that, air, that, na that nation and our communities in a way that we say that everybody has access to healthcare and that everybody actually, and you all in Canada have done a far, far greater job and are much closer to that than we have been in the US. But even your example sets a vision and a tone for the world, but we all can push and do better. And so I'm raising this because this is a moment that as we're talking about policy, what we really have to think about is really what are the foundation of where we will create that policy from, which leads me to what I'm just going to say share quickly of what I call the V strategies. And what are the V strategies? I think that right now in this moment, the question for me is, we are all having a human experience at the same time on this earth, that we're all in the largest health pandemic global pandemic in the last century that we are all witnessing seeing major shifts political shifts in some of the largest and the most powerful countries in the world including in the u.s we're all seeing racial tensions grow and issues around racism bubble up to the to the top right we're all experiencing having this experience at the same time. And for some, even for, for, for people who I've talked to recently, it can seem daunting or overwhelming. But the way that I see it is actually not just a challenge. We can actually look at it with the eyes of seeing it as an opportunity. You know, part of the reason why we experience pain is because pain lets us know that something is wrong so that we can be attentive to it. So if our chest hurts, then that is an indicator that something is wrong in our body and so that we can pay attention to it and that if we're attentive to it, we can actually stop and go to the source of what is creating not only the pain, but could ultimately lead to a, a health issue that could be detrimental to ourselves. And so I think the same thing exists now, that some of the discomfort and the pain that we're experiencing and that makes us like, oh, no, not another issue around racism. No, not another issue about police brutality. Oh, not another issue around climate change. That is actually providing an opportunity for us to do a couple of things, an opportunity for us to stop and slow down and be reflective around a question, two questions that I have. The first question is, what is being called of you in this moment? As whether it's you're an organizer, whether you are the founder of a, whether you are a current citizen, 
we all in this moment are having this collective experience. And so the question is, in this moment, what is being called of you? And the second th part of that question is, in the moment of thinking about what is being called of us, what are the possibilities that exist if we show up fully in our power and our presence with a vision? And so that starts the first V. There are four Vs that I'll share um, just quickly with you that I think we should be thinking about um, when we're talking about what, uh, what is the opportunity in this moment. The first opportunity in this moment, I think, is really around leaning into our vision. What is your vision? And so that goes back to the first question I asked you, what would this nation look without racism, your nation look like? Most people have never even been asked that question. So the truth of the matter is we will never create a nation without racism if we're not spending time thinking about what it would look like. We have to spend time thinking about, as we're talking about the restructuring of, the, of, of, of taxes in our nation, it's not just about the city. We also have to spend time of thinking about the possibility is that if we have a more fair and equitable tax system, what are the possibilities? And also be able to share that vision with others that may not understand or may not be interested or quite frankly, may not even feel like that's something that they care about. That, But what is very important is that the way that you're able to organize and change the, the minds and capture the imaginations of people is to be able to have a clear vision of the possibilities and the potential of what could be if we're operating power. The second V that I like to is the V that I call authentic voice. It is using our voice to speak truth to power. There is so much happening around us and in the world and through policy that we see every day that some of us kind of just see and shake our heads, right? But the bottom line is we all have to see ourselves as an instrument of change. You know, policy by itself, I can share from you in the U.S., policy by itself is not effective. What do I mean by that? Two prime examples. You know, in the state of, in the United States, Brown versus board, the Board of Education was act, which was the bill that desegregated schools. It was the, the, it was the ruling that desegregated, the case that desegregated schools in the United States was passed in 1954. However, most schools were not desegregated and were not integrated in the U.S. until the 70s. Part of that is once you have policy by itself, what we've seen across the world is that policy does not work by itself if you don't have the people power to make sure that those in power implement it and that we push it forward. And so that you've got to have public buy-in. And so what is really important that as we set this vision, that we also use our voice in a way, our voices in a way, an authentic voice, a voice that actually is not so caught up in the single issue, but actually the issue within the context of what is important to people in their day-to-day -day lives. That people know that we're raising this issue, not because this is what we want a win, just a policy win, because this is the one thing we care about, but that fundamentally we care about them, that they're the center of what we care about. And to the extent that this issue and this policy, this policy shift can make a change or a measurable change in their lives, that is why we want them to support it. So oftentimes I've seen people push policy and folks are just glazed over. They're not just glazing over because they don't understand the policy, they're glazing over because they don't see themselves in the center of that policy. And so we always have to put people in the center of the policy. And so as we are literally sharing these policy initiatives that we want to organize around or we want to get buy in, we always have to find a frame of using our authentic voice to actually be able to speak to what people are going to, to help make the connection of their own day to day lives so that in the center of whatever policy that we're pushing, it is people. The, the third V that I like to bring up is really centered around this notion of victory. Now, of course, we say, well, we all know what a victory is. Well, you know, that we, I can tell you in the U.S., our concept of victory has been deeply distorted. Perhaps it's because we're a big sports country. I'm not certain. But we are operating in the political landscape at this point as, as if we're in a big Super Bowl game. That there's the blue team and there's now, now the red team has, they can do whatever they want to do. And, and there's the blue team has the whole going to just clash and try to smash each other, right? And because of that damage, there's so many casualties. You know, in the U.S. right now, you know, we have over half a million people 
who have died for COVID because we have been treating public policy as if it's a football game, that they have been casualties to one team saying, we've got the ball and we're not going to give the ball and the other team saying, but we need the ball. And so instead of us literally understanding that fundamentally in the political landscape that we all are supposed to be on the same team and that is to advance and really increase the lives um, of people in our communities, that we are literally supposed to come up with solutions that jointly advance all of the citizens that we're collectively supposed to be tapping into our imaginations in ways that at the center of it, it's people and not just a policy, that until we get there, what we will continue to do is to have this destructive cycle of win and loss that means in order for me to win, you have to lose. And so the this the third V around victory is we have to shift the paradigm of how we see what is a political victory. We have to create solutions and shift ourselves and recognize that we're all sharing this earth together. And then we all have different approaches and different ideas. But if we love and the value of humanity right at the center of that, then our victories can look very different. Our victories will no longer look that in order for me to win, you have to lose. Our victories will no longer look like I have to destroy you or dismantle you or make you a liar or make you the boogeyman, but that if we can look at our victories and from the perspective of how can we have a win-win? And the win-win is not based on, I got all the policy pieces that I want and you didn't, but the win-win is how can we actually create an outcome that has the best, the widest, and the most impact for the, for the human beings that we actually represent. And so we shift the paradigm of what victory looks like, that we have to demand that of our political parties. We have to demand that of our leaders, that oftentimes in the U.S., when people ask me about voting rights, I was like, voting rights is not, my voting rights should not be contingent upon what political party is in office. Voting rights is not a left or right issue. It is a human, human issue. It's a humanity issue that my right as a human being, that I have the right I have agency that any decision that is made about me and my community, I should have some kind of in that decision making process. And so we have to reject these boxes and these paradigms that actually put one particular ideology against another political ideology. We have to literally take it out of that box and say, what does a true victory look like? A victory that actually will advance all of humanity, a victory that is broad enough, that is wide enough, that is high enough that all people can actually benefit from that. You know, and so that's the third V. And the final V that I'll say and I'll share as I get ready to wrap up is what I think is the most important. You know, the most important thing is oftentimes when we're talking about policy, we're talking about policy as if it's absent of people. You know, oftentimes I like you hear where people we we actually extract the humanity out of a out, out of the policy. It becomes a this and a that, it becomes data points, it becomes numbers. Um, and we're not really thinking about or able to actually articulate the day-to-day -day impact that it will have on people. And so this last final V, which I think all of this is actually sits in, is in this notion of what are our values? You know, even the work that I do around supporting democracy, I've been a pro-democracy organizer my entire life, work that I've done. This is the work that I've dedicated my life to. And so in that space, though, as, as I think about the work, the work that I do in democracy, right, is that that's not the end goal for me. The end goal for me is actually how do I advance humanity? And democracy is important for, to me to the extent that democracy is the system by which people is the process why, in which people engage in their agency to make a collective decision on what they want to see in terms of going forward in the future and then and then move forward. And so um, and, to, and to move forward. And so in that process, right, the ultimate goal is the advancement of humanity. Democracy is a means to an end and not an end in itself. And so I raise that as I get ready to close out. I raise that in the context that what in fact we're doing, we have to do is we literally have to think about what are our values, that we cannot allow these, uh, the, the, the spin, the spin doctors to tell us that we care about this issue and this issue and this issue. We care so much about this issue that we're willing. You, we can't say, there can't, you, we can't take this position that someone is um, pro-life 
and it's okay with 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 hundreds of children being locked in cages and treated as if they are not human beings or call other human beings aliens because they have a different color passport when we're all on this earth together or even do things that we actually think that is oh, in the midst of a pandemic as, as was previously said that there are people who are there are people who are actually getting resources that people are getting enriched while others are being evicted. Thousands of people are being evicted out of their homes or by where people are um, being um, are losing everything, right? Because they've lost their jobs or they're, eat or they're running out of food. That this is the moment for us to be compassionate. This is the moment for us to radically reimagine. And so as I get ready to close, I just want you to remember those because I think that that is fundamentally what is being called of us in this moment. That in this moment that seem, that is seem very challenging and difficult, this is a moment for our reassessment, you know, for us to really think about how can we build a nation? How can we world, build a world, a global community that actually the resources that exist in this world, we can actually use those resources in a way that will advance humanity so that the core belief and fundamental value of everything that we do is driven by this notion of for the love of humanity. How much better will we all be? Well, the first thing I did right was the day I started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on. The ultimate prize for us is literally centering how we can use our intellect, how we can be innovative, how we can use our voice, our vision, our shift in the paradigm of what a victory is and our values to line up in such a way that we are actually moving forward, driven by the love of humanity. So we advance the quality of life, that we advance the health and the healing of this planet and this earth for all of us moving forward. Thank you. Your inspiring words and your clear vision, authentic voice, victory values, I think for a lot of organizers uh, out there, they have, um, they've been inspired by your message to keep going. I, I think uh, some listeners though, uh, might be interested to dig into how exactly they can translate uh, those values and that messaging into electoral victory. I want to uh, first uh, just mention to the people who are joining us a little bit late that uh, the line uh, for Latasha is a little bit uh, wonky because she's calling us from a truck because she <laughs> is in a neighborhood with a power outage. So please be patient and generous with us. I also want to mention to you that while we're going to chat for about 20 minutes, we will be taking your questions. So you can write your questions in what I'm told is called a session chat. I don't see this, but uh, somebody will be sending me questions from the session chat. So if you could just please start your question with the word question, like write, literally write out question in that chat box, um, we will know that it is a question for Letitia and we will be able to put it to her. Um, so let me perhaps begin with your own experience running, because I have heard uh, this, this fascinating story, frankly, about um, what perhaps led you to personally decide that this was something that you, uh, you felt mobilized to do. So, you know, I started, we started Black Voters Matter in 2016 and people who may or may not know, um, we are a power building organization started by Cliff Albright and I. Uh, our first big race was in Alabama, and then we um, we're known for I guess our most recent win was connected to Georgia, the work that we did in Georgia. But we wanted to create an organization that did a couple of things: one that would build local capacity, that we would work in organization, we would work throughout the country, worked in 15 states out the country, that we provide resources um, and support, that we would shift the narrative of how Black voters thought about themselves and how we actually um, communicated who we were to each other and that we had in fact power. And then the third thing is that we wanted to actually be able to lift up the leadership pipeline and build out the ecosystem of how you can actually build power. And so how I came about this, I actually have been doing this kind of work for the last two and a half decades. Uh, my work has been centered, as I said, I grew up in Selma, Alabama. So there's almost, it's probably impossible to live in, in a place like Selma and not do 
uh, not be exposed to the voting rights movement. And so I was very moved by, um, I always was intrigued by politics. I was always intrigued by power. And so I got engaged very young as a young organizer, really doing elections and um, doing voter registrations. And so at the age of 28, I decided to run for office. So I ran for um, actually, I didn't decide to run for office. The, the, the truth of the matter is I was recruited. I had done a lot of work. I was doing a lot of education reform work in my community. And I, and I, and I actually am really honored um, about what happened in this process because I actually think this is why how people should run for office. I was recruited. There are people, local folks who I worked with that said, you're such a strong voice and advocate for education, what we need that kind of leadership on the State Board of Education. And I, you know, I was a young person, really didn't know what I was walking into, but I decided to run for State Board of Education uh, to really be able to lift up the issues that were happening to young people at that time because I was so passionate about it. And so I ran for this race. I actually, my campaign office, I guess I got something, I guess I should be okay with having an office in a car um, because my campaign office was actually a Jetta. My campaign office was a Jetta. Um, and I got all my campaign materials from uh, Kinko's Fed FedEx, which is like a copy print place here. And so after a couple of months doing that work, um, we, I, I, we, we were in the election and I ran against a 12 year incumbent. You know, I did not have the name recognition. I did at the time, I think I was making $15,000 a year. I didn't have any money, um, but I could organize. And that's when I learned kind of in that, this particular race, I learned three key points. And the first point is I learned around the power of organizing because while I didn't have the name recognition, I was not the favorite candidate. I came out of nowhere. I was running against a 12 year incumbent that they had just named a college after. Uh, what I did have is I had the ability to organize and get people engaged around a vision, a particular kind of vision that I thought we needed for education reform in the state of Alabama. And that's how I enfolded them in this vision. And so I ran and then at the end of the election, it wound up being um, such a, a such a close race that they could not call the election. Matter of fact, I'd gotten a phone call the night of the election congratulating me on the win, um, but they, did, they had not called it yet. And so it took them over a week, it went back and forth and it took a week um, between making a decision whether the counting the votes, whether it's myself or my opponent who won. Well, the, at the end of the day, at the end of the count, my opponent had 117 votes, less than 200 votes more than I did in the statewide election, which was actually phenomenal for a first time mm -hmm. candidate to run. And so I conceded, I called him and congratulated him not knowing that um, I would get a, uh, I would soon get a phone call. I got a phone call from my mentor who was a state senator at the time that said, brace yourself, the Democratic Party is about to call you, the chair of the Democratic Party. And I was like, okay, all right. This was at, the race was actually certified by the state party at 12 o'clock. Uh, I got this phone call at 12.05, literally like five minutes late, 12.07, 12.07, um, a couple of minutes later. And then the state chair called me. And the state chair called being very, very profusely apologetic, saying, Latasha, I'm so sorry to make this phone call to you, but I just wanted to let you know that the sheriff of Wilcox County, which is one of the counties that I carried overwhelmingly, the sheriff of Wilcox County just found 800 ballots that he put up in the safe that he forgot. So in my naivety, of course, they're ballots, they're valid ballots. He knows that they are valid ballots because he put them there. So that's an easy solution. You're going to count them, right? So I say to um, the chair of the party, Giles Perkins, I said, well, great. So let me know, when are you all going to count them? And he said, well, we can't count them. And I, I, I don't understand. Explain that to me. And he said, because the race has already been certified, we're not going to be able to count, count the votes. Um, so those 800 votes were, that were cast because the sheriff forgot about them, and, but he conveniently remembered five minutes after the race was certified, they can't be counted. And he said, no, ma'am, I'm sorry, they can't. I was like, well, what is my recourse? He's the only thing I can say is seek re legal remedy. And I called and it was like $50,000. I mean, I read a campaign, a grassroots campaign. It was just unconscionable for me to be able to challenge that. But I remember feeling so powerless that they had stolen this race right up under me and it was nothing that I could do about it. And there, there was no one held. The kid was a sheriff who had been entrusted these absentee ballots that convenient after seven days, right, five after the whole, whole week, conveniently remembered 
that he had in a county that I that I was strong in. Um, and those, those va ballots essentially not was I cheated, but those 800 voters were cheated. And there was nothing that could be really their votes were thrown away. Um, and no one was held accountable. And so that was kind of the first time for me that I actually suppression. This was in 1998. Suppression and, and in a way that directly impacted me. And I saw how it impacted voters. And I really, at that moment, I actually do something about it. Okay, thank you for being patient with me. Um, I know you may have another question for me. I kind of, so I'm okay. Okay, so we were wrapping up. So you found out you had 800 missing vo votes and instead of being discouraged and eating ice cream and spending months in your bed, you decided I'm gonna organize. Absolutely, I did eat ice cream though. <laughs> I just ate, ate ice cream so and I organized. Was that like the germination of the idea for Black Voters Matter? You know, I don't think in, in my mind at the time, it wasn't what I was thinking, but it was. In many ways it was because Cliff Albright, who's the other co-founder was also a part of that process with me as well. And so part of what we did is that fundamentally what we were able to do is um, from that campaign, we continue to support other campaigns and we actually experienced the same thing. And so over the last 20 years, we were able to create this model that was really rooted in how do you build power by organizing local organizations? And so over the over the course of the last two, two, 20 years, we were able to actually build relationships and actually see, we actually filed lawsuits. Two years after that, we filed another lawsuit where we actually challenged um, and got a, so a, a ruling in the Supreme, Alabama Supreme Court um, around a voter suppression tactic. And so since that time, it was, I do think that it was the, the catalyst around how can we impact voter suppression. And so currently as we're, what people may or may not know if they're following the news, we're actually fighting it again here in Georgia. And so in Georgia, as we speak, you know, we have, um, we have some egregious ominous bills that one that passed the Senate just on Monday um, that literally will severely restrict um, access to the ballot. And so the interesting thing is organizing work. So just on yesterday, one of the groups that we work with, one of our, some of our organizers, one, the, the lead representative who's, who's leading and crafted, they're calling him voter suppressor in chief, they were able to put pressure on the county commissioner county commission that he actually serves as a county attorney and he's lost his contract. And so I'm quite sure today he's probably rethinking what his role. And so they're literally, we've launched a campaign that all of those elected officials, they own businesses, they have business interests. They also sit on boards that this will not be business as usual. That at the end of the day, that we are relentless about supporting democracy. So organizing works just to say, well, we're, we're going to leave this within the political landscape and okay, we're going to put pressure on the Republicans or the Democrats. Well, in the state of Georgia, the Republicans control the House, the Senate, and the governor's office. So they're not trying to listen to Black voters. Matter of fact, their efforts are quite frankly to marginalize us. But the power that we do have is, and I think that's a lesson for organizers, you have to really understand where your power is. And though we know we have power as consumers, that Black voters, Black people in the state of Georgia we contribute $106 billion to the Georgia economy. So we have consumer power. So what we have done is we've launched a campaign against our corporate, um, uh, with our corporate uh, uh, corporate citizens. And not necessarily, you know, I, I tell folks, it's not an attack, it's actually an opportunity. To me, I think it's a layup. Like we're saying that, okay, Coca-Cola, multinational company that has a brand of $74 billion that is based in Georgia, since you're saying that you're committed to racial equity, that you're based right here in Georgia, that your board, your employees, your workers, your consumers, that you have black voters that actually support that, we're asking you, we're calling you to question. Are you with us? Are you standing for voting rights? Or do you wanna go back 56 years ago where we had this fight? We've targeted companies like AT&T, um, Home Depot, uh, um, the Southern Company, which is the power company um, that is there and others that are actually rooted in that community. And it seems like that's been far more effective because we're actually looking at the, power po the pressure points. And for those co uh, counties that we're working in, the lead um, 
the lead supporters of the bills actually own businesses. And so we've got people who are pulling their, one of the businesses insurance company. We've got black families that are pulling their insurance policies from those businesses. That is getting their attention, right? And so my point is we have to find other ways of leverage to get the attention to let people know that we're not going to allow democracy to be undermined on un unraveled without actually having a consequence and so companies like coca-cola and others have to be held accountable they have to be given the the opportunity i think this is a perfect opportunity we're giving them the layup we're like here's the layup all you have to do is actually you can actually be a wonderful example of how you can be a corporate citizen and so that's kind of the work that we're doing now and but believe it or not something as simple as what I experienced in 1998 did lay the foundation because what we did recognize after that is that public policy without people power, as I said earlier, it doesn't work and right, or it has not been effective. And so for us, it is really engaging people in the process that helps educate them, to ignite them and to mobilize them, but to seek change because when people actually seek and fight for that change, it's much, much harder to take it away from them. Yeah, for the people who are not familiar with what Latush is talking about, um, Georgia's Senate and its House actually have both, uh, one's debating, the House is debating, the Senate has passed a bill that passed by basically one vote um, that prevents people who voted by mail, if you're under 65 years old, you would not be able to vote by mail unless you have a disability. And even then you would have to show your driver's license Basically, the, the points where uh, I would say organizations like yours in January were incredibly successful, whether it was advanced voting or mail-in ballots, the Republicans have heavily attacked that. I mean, it's not even hidden. It's a completely plain view what they're trying to do. How do you uh, ensure that voters don't get discouraged by such tactics, that they don't That's turn around and say, well, it doesn't, it doesn't matter? That's a great One question. Step back. One step forward, two yeah. steps back. I do. That's a great question. But I do want to note, too, what's ironic is that in 2000, the whole absentee ballot, one of the pieces that's being attacked in the bill is that it will restrict absentee ballot because of, of access. And so that if you desire to cast your vote as an absentee, you are allowed to education and get that. And so this last election cycle, we had the largest number of absentee ballots because of COVID-19. And so one third of the state um, actually supported, um, uh, uh, participated in terms of absentee ballot voting. The irony is, you know, that the Republicans actually were the ones that created that b provision, that bill, because it was targeted at the time for rural white voters. They wanted rural white voters um, who had a hard time maybe not having access to um, the voting dates to actually have expanded. We supported that because we believe all voters, war, rural white voters, urban voters, everybody should have access, free and fair access to the ballot, right? And so unfortunately, what they did not anticipate, now all of a sudden, because black voters overwhelmingly use that tool, is no longer needed. So this is the same tool, quite frankly, that they actually introduced um, and brought to the, brought to the um, legislature as a bill. So I just think that's ironic just to, to, just to share. But you know, I think part of the way that we keep people engaged in this process is we have to make this be about more than a vote. That we have to actually make this be a centered around the notion that people have power. You know, we have to center this around the notion that we have the right to decide what governs us, who governs us, and under what conditions. It's our tax money. They're our tax. We've got this thing so flipped up that now we actually have electeds deciding who the voters are. That's not how that's supposed to work. <laughs> Voters are supp supposed to decide who will be elected, right? And so there is a fundamental kind of uh, a weakening of democracy when you don't have people participating. And see, over the years, I think there has been a move to have kind of this proxy approach that, yeah, just come out and vote, but leave it up to us. We got all the power. We'll, we know what to do with it, right? And so, you know, over the years, we're saying we're going to take our power back that the constitution says we the people, it does not say we the political parties or we the electeds. And so the way that we have found that you engage people is that instead of centering around a single issue, instead of sing singling it around a candidate, you know, that you're waiting for the charismatic candidate to come on the white horse and save us all. You know, of course we want strong candidates, but I'll give an example in this last election cycle in Georgia, um, President, Biden, President Biden got more votes than President Obama. 
from the black community. Now, now we're not as excited. <laughs> Certainly people don't think we're more excited about Biden than we were Obama. So what was the element? The element was that we actually shifted that the focus wasn't just around, we're gonna get the perfect candidate to save us because they're not, none of them are perfect. But that one, we're going to fundamentally use our voice and our vote as a, a demonstration of our agency. And so our campaign, this election cycle was around the notion of we, we got power. And so I think it's the focal point that literally if you're organizing and you, as I said earlier, it has been, it has shown itself to be very effective in the campaigns that I worked in that literally more so than the issue that you center people. If you center people, they can actually see their purpose and that in this proximity, they can see how the issue connects to them. It's kind of like the Janet Jackson song. What have you done for me lately? If you're creating an issue around what people can actually see, how that issue actually impacts their day to day lives, they're far more engaged because they can see themselves in it. So that's part of the way that we keep. And in addition to that, we lean into culture. So just as I did earlier, we use music, we use song, we use food. We actually affirm, so we create a process that could be very daunting. It could be boring. It could be traumatic, right? People standing in line, two, three, four, five, 11 hours, as long as 11 hours. Yes, that happened last year. You know, that we can actually create a process that is celebratory, that is collective, about collective power. And it's not even what we've also found is that while our vote is individual, that literally when people see their individual vo voice as part of a collective effort, that seems to resonate much better with people as well. So even in our language, we say you matter, I matter, but the what's most powerful, what has resonated with people when we say we matter. I think for a Canadian audience, one of the examples of the, the we matter electorally might be the Liberals 2015 election campaign targeted towards young people. And I know, Latasha, that won't mean anything for you, but they really designed a campaign that uh, made young people feel like they could have a collective, uh, they could make a collective difference. Um, I wonder though, and when, you know, I, I hear you talk about a few things that bring to mind some of the challenges, especially with progressive parties, there is often a debate about our candidate is not perfect enough. Either they're too centrist or they're not centrist enough. Uh, they don't, they're not what we wanted to. So why should, they're just going to be like, every other candidate, why should we bother going to the polls? And then I'll tack on another one, is that once you have had that success, how do you ensure that you're not starting from scratch again, in, in our case, four years, in your case, two years, uh, how do you maintain that pool of potential voters that you've just engaged and created? That's an excellent question. The first point is, it goes back to kind of my previous point. I mean, I think part of the way that reason why people have disengaged in this process is because we have made the political process too much, too candidate centered is around, let's find the perfect candidate. As if we're finding, can I find the perfect husband or perfect wife? We're not marrying anybody. We want somebody to go and represent our issues, right? And so my point is, it's really important for us to shift the paradigm of how we even see political power. This is really about having someone, who can we get in the office that actually will represent our issues, but not necessarily just leave it up to them. That's kind of the proxy approach, right? But we also have to, it doesn't matter who it is, you always have to have a carrot and a stick. Are we organized enough that whoever is in office, that we can apply enough pressure to actually make sure that they are literally responsive to the community? And can we provide enough pressure and incentive for them to do right by communities? And so part of that, I think there's an inside outside strategy. And unfortunately, I think what we've done that has been a fatal flaw around building political power and strengthening democracy over time has been two things. One, we've been two candidates a party centered so that is centered around everything rests on whether we can find the perfect candidate when we know that they don't exist and even those candidates that are extremely powerful or popular right those candidates are still going to go within a system an existing system and their impact is going to be limited so you know there there have been candidates that i've worked with there have been elected officials that say I can't take this position publicly, make me do right, right? That they actually want the outside pressure to actually be able to almost in some ways let themselves off a hook. I, I still don't think that's the most courageous position, but nevertheless, there are those who I've actually had that experience with. And so I'm saying that, that I think there's the first thing is to your question is we literally have to keep, we have to shift the paradigm and let this be people centered and not candidate centered and really centered around our, what our interests are. 
right? Either you can deliver or you can't. You can be really, really nice, but can you deliver, <laughs> right? That's what we need, right? And so, and I think the outside strategy has to be, which is what we do with Black Voters Matter, can we build the ecosystem, the kind of organizing infrastructure that regardless of who is in office, whether it's a friend or foe, we have the kind of organizing power that we can force them to respond to what we need them to respond to in the moment, right? And also, do we have enough organizing power on the outside that is actually an incentive for them to do right, to do what we are, uh, desire for them to do. And so I think that that's part of the piece. I think the second part of it too, you know, around keeping people engaged is that this notion of, I think that's another fatal flaw, that there's been this kind of um, obsession with quote the super voter and your base, right? And usually that base is who are those voters that are going to support me no matter what, that's who I want, right? You know, that's not real democratic power, to be honest. That What that is, is that's a fan club, right? You know, and so I think on some level, what we have to do is really become more sophisticated to shift that paradigm that part of what anybody is in office is to respond to everybody, that we are to respond to how do we create the, the, the framework for the quality of life to be increased for, for, for citizens. And I think part of doing that is you always have to have a growing electorate until we have 100% voter participation, like we, we still have work to do. We can't just say, well, I've got two more people than, okay, we've got more people than you have. So I got two more people than you have. The goal in democracy, it says for all people, and so fundamentally, we have to really accept this principle that is in our engagement process that one, yes, there is a base of voters that you constantly can depend on the super voters, but you also have to literally where the power resides, those people who have felt just marginalized and disengaged from the process. That is essentially what happened in Georgia. What happened in Georgia, we were able to actually wake up the sleeping giant that instead there are people that we talked to that some folks would just actually overlook that they didn't think about talking to them because of, we talk to children. I've got campaign um, uh, uh, campaign videos that I spent time with children. I remember one reporter and said, well, you're in the heat of a campaign. Why are you spending so much time talking to children? Because children matter, right? Because they matter. And if we're creating a culture in our community that people matter, that it actually shifts the dynamic of how when they grow up, that they'll engage in the voting process. And also I got a secret to tell you, children are some of the best campaigners in the world. Like we literally did a campaign when I ran for office that I shared about earlier in 2000, I mean, 1998, um, I created these buttons for my campaign and it was a vote for me until I can. And one day I was riding down the street and some lady pulled me over and she said, please give me one of those buttons because um, my child is bugging me to death. I cannot tell you the number of parents that I would see going in the uh, shopping malls that said, my child was like, we gotta go vote for Miss Latasha Brown. I had this jingle. So I actually ran these commercials. My commercials were all children because it was a board of education. And the jingle was, who's gonna turn education around? Latasha Brown, Latasha Brown. Who's gonna help kids all around? Latasha Brown, Latasha Brown. And it was all kids. There were no adults in the commercial. Every human being <laughs> with an earshot knew that commercial and so i would run into children in the grocery stores that said i'm gonna vote for you miss latasha brown i'm gonna vote for you and so what it did is it set off this this culture of like community and family i honestly don't believe i would have been competitive in that race had i not tapped into this to children and literally creating a way to engage family in the conversation because I'm quite sure those same children went home and was like, who's Miss Latasha Brown? I want to vote for her. And it may create something else. My point is that we have to literally start looking at whole our communities as whole communities, not just start like literally how many times we just like kind of segment it out. Let's just go after the super voter. The real power is in democracy. And if democracy means all the people, then that means we have a responsibility to constantly seek to engage people. I think we could keep going on for the next few hours, frankly. Um, it's been a real treat speaking with you. Thank you so much for your words. I hope the audience is uh, very rich out of this. I know I have. Um, and I'll throw it back to Brittany and Latasha Brown. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.